I'm, I'm hitting record. We're all now. alive. Well, well, we're all here after that amazing technical <laughs> journey. <laughs> Let's not talk about that. No, no. As far as anyone no. watching this video is concerned, this worked perfectly. We oh, definitely, so definitely did we not love spend technology. 20 minutes trying to get the video working <laughs> at all. You should so come to this conference. Yes. <laughs> So there will be no technical difficulties. Nothing at all. Like all events, Everything they will go perfectly. Everything will go very smoothly. Yeah. <laughs> well, on that, <laughs> yeah, on that, Carla and Vanessa, thank you very much for your time and your faces. Um, thank you. I think we should start, because, Carl, we've spoken before. Uh, I think we should start with Vanessa. Vanessa, who the devil are you? And, and, what yes. is, and what is this event that I'm going to in London in May? Um, well, I'm Vanessa Sinclair. I'm a psychoanalyst. I live in New York. I have a private practice here. Um, I worked in an HIV clinic for a long time. So that's one of my kind of special areas. And I'm trained, as I said, as a psychoanalyst as well as a psychologist. Um, so I do the whole Freudian lay on the couch and tell me about your mother type treatment. Um, and a friend of mine and I were not happy with psychoanalytic training as we went through the Institute. So we started our own psychoanalytic group here where we help facilitate free classes and lectures. Um, and we run supervision groups and that sort of thing so that people can get access to psychoanalytic ideas, um, and training essentially without having to sign up for five to seven years in a training institute. So, yeah, that's what I do. Um, and this event in May came about, um, these three fields are basically my main areas of interest and have been for pretty much all of my adult life. Um, and about a year ago, I had had months of, pretty much every tarot reader or diviner or just intuitive friend that I met with or had dinner with kept asking me if I was writing a book. And after like the 15th time of this, I was like, maybe I should think about writing a book. So I decided to print out all of the papers that I had written for the past five years or so, um, which is a lot of like art reviews and just psychoanalytic, psychoanalytic bent on different arts mostly. Um, and I read through all of the papers and I realized there was definitely a theme and kind of the theme tying it together. Interesting enough was the cut and cut up. Oh. Um, is that how you met this reprobate? Yeah, I actually met Carl at Catland like, like three years ago, okay. um, in 2013 when he was here in New York promoting his book, Mother Have a Nice Trip. Safe um, trip. Safe trip. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, so that's how we met originally. It was at Catland. Cool. Um, and then we both know Jen, and Carl told me that he really had a thing for psychoanalysis and didn't have an analyst contributing to the Fenris Wolf um, and asked if I had any papers lying around. And actually, that's a funny story as well. Did you have any paper laying around that you haven't done anything with? And I was actually just getting frustrated with and leaving psychoanalytic training at the time. And I had used this deadline, this like candidate, they called the psychoanalytic trainees candidates. They had like a candidate paper contest. And I was like, nobody in this institution wants to listen to what I have to say, but I'm going to use this deadline to write this paper. Um, so I wrote a paper on psychoanalysis and data and the intersections between the, the two theories and how they were both kind of being born at the same time um, in the turn of the century, the last century. Um, so this paper that I did for this training that was a disaster ended up going into the Fen result, which was a nice home for it to have after all of that. Very cool. Very cool. So we'll move to Carl. Uh, you maybe know a little bit about the intersection between occult and art. So I guess like you guys met at uh, Catlan, great bookstore. Mm. Uh, I mean, was this, we're talking about an event that's on in May that is uh, discussing the kind of intersection between psychoanalysis, art and the occult. Mm -hmm. So uh, question one uh, for Carl would be um, where you see that overlap yourself 
because then I have some follow-up psychoanalytic questions about both your mothers. Um, but we'll go with <laughs> art and the occult to start with. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that, uh, you know, over these past, say, uh, five to ten years, actually, it's been a long, long trend going now, is that there's been an emergence in attention, basically, um, on the intersection. And the intersection is not, you know, it's not possible to generalize, but we can see an increase in interest, for instance, in within academia, we can see it in the art world, we can see it in budding artists, and we can see it sort of, uh, it's more uh, blatant or flamboyant in a way. Uh, so thereby, it's a very... Uh, you know, uh, interesting field to study. Uh, I've been interested in this uh, basically since I became interested in in the occult, which is sort of uh, my teenage years. So for me, it's just uh, in a way a joy uh, to see it bloom in this uh, more uh, visible way, simply. Um, and of course, that ties in very much with uh, you know the emergence of uh, psychology and the emerg in that also of psychoanal psychoanalysis and um it's um i don't know it deals with the same things just expressing it in different languages uh, and i think one common denominator of all these things is basically introspection whether you're on your own or whether you have a canvas or a blank piece of paper or with an analyst or a psychologist, it's just um, um, a need to go from viewing the world to viewing the inner world instead. And then what you do with that and in which context you use it, that's you know um, each and everyone's uh, angle or story. But I think there are so many things in, in similar between all these fields and uh, concerning specifically the art and occult, I think it's um, it's just evident. It's the same kinds of mechanisms. It's the same kind of processes. And I, as you know, have almost advocated uh, an interchange that we should really actively try and change these terms to take out the arcane occult stuff and put some new artistic terms or concepts in there instead, and also vice versa, because I think that kind of uh, hybridization is very healthy. It's it's definitely very useful. So, uh, Carl, you said something that uh, I think is quite descriptive, which is these three fields deal with the same thing. So my question for Vanessa is... I mean, most people watching and listening to this will agree. However, from the occult perspective, uh, the first thing people think of is Jung. Uh, and I mean, I'm guilty of that. I, I, I mean, I'm aware that Freud was a member of the Society for Psychical Research and he had, he had certain private opinions about the occult, uh, but they weren't necessarily expressed publicly. So if you look at where uh, there's certainly a, a huge overlap, which we're going to go into between, say, a Freudian perspective on psychoanalysis and art. But when it comes specifically to the occult and mm -hmm. psychoanalysis, people go Jung before they go Freud. So where, like, like why is um, why is it time for the Freudian angle? And, and what do you think that is? Well, um, one thing I wanted to touch on that you were just talking about is that the, the intersection between these three fields for me as well is that they're all part of creation and the creative process. And I see psychoanalysis as a creative process and arts are as well, obviously, in the cult as well. Um, and they really give people a sense of agency as well and like being able to be co-creators of our lives. Um, so to me, that's very important. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to have this conference in the first place is because of this framework that everybody who talks about anything occult ends up going automatically through a Jungian framework. And while I admire Jung and think his work is really important, I don't necessarily ascribe to it or think in Jungian terms. And I haven't really had a place to discuss any of this um, or anyone to discuss it with from a Freudian or Lacanian lens because the field is so completely divided. Like all of academia, um, well, the little academia that has psychoanalysis left, but all of academia is very Freudian and Lacanian and Jung has no place there. And the Jungians are completely isolated and they're kind of a completely different kind of psychoanalysis. And the two don't interact really at all. Like they're, they're, they're really, really separate. And that split, you know, obviously began with Freud and Jung themselves and it's continued on for an entire century now. Um, so I really wanted to heal that split because I think that's very important. And, 
um, I think that it would be much more useful for, for those parts of psychoanalysis to be speaking to one another as well. Um, and that's why, like I said, we were originally going to have this conference at the Freud Museum in London because I had a contact there, and I thought it'd be really nice to be able to have this discussion in Freud's home office space um, to kind of heal the split like at the source. Um, but unfortunately, the Freud Museum apparently is a little bit outside of London and also is a very small venue. And then when we decided to add the art show um, and just had so much positive feedback at the conference, we realized we were going to ha need a much bigger space. So we ended up at Candid Arts, which has actually turned out really well. Yeah, and it's a good part of town, as we were, we were discussing before. So the after parties are mm -hmm. going to be fun. <laughs> so what are the fundamental right. differences then? Uh, I mean, you're completely correct uh, when people, particularly when it comes to the occult or metaphysics, will go young in particular, especially now post-2009 that the Red Book has come out, which is amazing, but uh, it certainly mm -hmm. leads people to think in, in that direction. So what, what are the fundamental uh, differences from a layman perspective um, that make it worthwhile to kind of provide a, a, a Freudian uh, psychoanalytic perspective on this intersection in addition to, uh, and again, you know, as you say, healing the split and being able to use both, in addition to the Jungian one, what are the differences that we would be talking about? Because like, people watching or listening to this are going to be thinking archetypes, collective unconscious, etc. Right, and I think that's all very important and I appreciate Jung's theory, but I don't use any of Jung's theory at all in my clinical work. Um, I think it's really interesting when thinking about like history and mythology and occult work, but I really don't see myself ever using his theory with patients. Um, and I think, well, one other thing that you had said that Freud was interested in the occult early on, but didn't really do it publicly. He did write about six papers about occult topics early on and him and Jung and for Sandor Ferenzi um, all were really, really interested in the occult early on, and he wrote papers on telepathy and as dreams, as premonitions, um, and that sort of thing, which one of our participants, Stephen Reisner, is going to talk about um, at the conference. Uh, he's a Freudian scholar. But for me, it's really um, where, the, where the kind of intersection between these fields came. Like I said, these are three parts of my life that have always been part of my life, but I haven't ever really integrated them before. Um, so this just isn't like a, a academic practice. This is actually like me bringing together all these different fields um, that have been part of my life for my own personal self and journey, um, and which has been really interesting. But the way it came together, like I said, was through the cut, which is interesting and is more of a Lacanian concept. Uh, Jacques Lacan is a French psychoanalyst that's been really popular since the 1960s or so. Um, and he talked about the cut in psychoanalytic theory. He calls it scansion. Um, and so basically the idea is instead of when you think of going to see a therapist or an analyst, you think of telling somebody all of your issues and they kind of like see this bigger picture, this way that it fits in, like, like you could say a Jungian point of view, like, oh, this could be from these kinds of archetypes or that sort of thing. And the analyst kind of makes sense of what the patient is saying. Um, Lacan's idea is quite the opposite, where he and I agree, think that people have enough of that going on and are inundated enough with these ideas from the outside. And I actually find it quite violent to kind of place ideas upon patients and try to explain to people what they're thinking. Instead, I try to kind of disrupt their own narratives that they've already internalized and taught themselves to society and their families and what they've read and that sort of thing try to get them out of narratives and out of patterns of thinking so much so that they can have opening and have space to create a little bit of a new narrative for themselves. So that's where the cut comes in. Like by in order to cut somebody's narrative, you just disrupt them or interrupt them in the middle of a story. Say you're telling me a story about work and what happened and you could go on about your boss or your coworkers all day. Um, but I'll just hear a word that sounds kind of out of place or, something like that, and I'll just stop the patient and get them to focus on that word. Why did you choose that word? What did you mean by that word? Tell me more about that. Where did this idea come from? And get them to, to inter interrupt themselves and kind of think more about what, why they're saying what they're saying instead of just speaking. 
So, Carl, that sounds like music to your ears when we're talking about uh, cut-ups and, and, and disruptive words and, and that kind of individualized creative process. So, care to jump in? Sure, absolutely. And, I mean, <clears throat> that's a very... Uh... Uh, just an interesting uh, concept. But again, I'd like to return also to these similarities in between all these different, uh, you know, clusters of theories and, and clusters of, of practice also. Uh, and I would like to draw a comparison between these two main contenders, Jung and Freud, uh, and make the comparison that, uh, of course, essentially it's really not that different because it's all about the same thing, um, helping people in a therapeutic way or helping yourself in a therapeutic way. If we jump over to the occult side, so to speak, uh, we know that there are, you know, this thing called Western sermon, the sermon, ceremonial tradition and there is this influx of um, you know western african and and uh, magic from the west indies and south america and scandinavia uh, but basically it's all the same so you have all of these <coughs> culturally uh, different flavors um, and yet it's exactly the same idea the same goals etc and i think in the in terms of jung and freud it's um, i don't know what i specifically would compare it to in the magical world but i mean jung is so much more um, cosmic and freud is a bit more um, worldly in a sense and more uh, causal and rational in a way and i mean there are many si diff uh, sort of similar um, occurrences in the magical traditions also um, so in that sense <clears throat> i'm looking forward to very much to actually be a part of this force field of people coming from these different traditions and see what kind of you know potential third minds could arise from this not only in terms of continued discussions uh, or um, publications or, or uh, but just to see uh, what goes on there because I, I suspect and I hope that everyone will just um, uh, draw a sigh of relief afterwards and say yes that was wonderful because uh, although we speak different languages slightly and everyone is sort of prejudiced against everyone uh, at least on some level uh, then just to find that uh, this is uh, really food for thought and possible building blocks for further uh, hybrids yeah we really hope that it's a like weekend brainstorming event yes. and specifically there were so many excellent submissions and i wanted to thank everybody we had like more than double submissions than we had time slots um but i specifically when going through the submissions wanted to make sure it was really eclectic and wanted to make sure that all different points of views and backgrounds and theoretical orientations were represented so that we could have a really great dialogue yeah well it seems i mean that's quite impressive that you got more than double because it's still a three-day event. Uh, I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it does seem very well programmed in that way. Like it's it's quite a tantalizing list. So, I mean, do you guys, Carl or Vanessa, do you want to jump in and kind of talk about who you've got coming and what you know um, they're going to be chatting about? Like what what's going to happen? It's 5th to the 7th of May, isn't it? Yes. Yes, yeah, so the 5th to the 8th, actually. 8th, of and course, because it's three th days. Yeah, the fifth being uh, the uh, opening uh, event, which is free to the public. And that's the opening, basically, of, of the event as, as such, but also specifically the art exhibition. Uh, there's going to be, um, uh, at the same venue, a fantastic exhibition of um, paintings uh, and artwork in general that we think fit within this very wide and, and uh, uh, open-minded scope. So we'll have everything from, from very contemporary stuff uh, back to uh, Austin Spare, and there's also going to be some uh, McNeil, William Burroughs um, uh, collaboration and just uh, amazing stuff, really. Uh, so in that sense, the first evening will be a social evening, uh, look at the art, talk about what's going to happen, etc. And then there will be three solid days of um, uh, intellectual, not meltdowns, but uh, <laughs> eleva elevations. See, I love events that are programmed, uh, assuming you get and and by the looks of the lineup you have, but I love events that have lots of panels because mm. you do have that uh, those additional voices, and if you've got a very good moderator, then it really does allow for that kind of brainstorm slash meltdown where people yeah. get to experience the different ideas and, and thrash something out. So, in terms of topics, Vanessa, where how might we whet people's appetites? All right. Um, well, one of the great things that I love about having this at the gallery venue is that it's from noon till 10 we have the space. So we all we can all like 
have a nice morning each morning and like have breakfast before we go. I can't stand going to academic conferences at eight in the morning anymore. <laughs> so that makes me happy. You don't, you don't like network, <laughs> you don't like networking breakfasts, standing there drinking cold tea, <laughs> trying to talk to people in a name badge. No. <laughs> <laughs> in a conference center. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, but we have to start off the conference. Um, we have a really great panel. Um, I specifically put this fantastic uh, presenter, Kai Armand, on first. Um, he uh, is a Haitian voodoo practitioner and a shaman in, initiated into several different ways, actually. But he's going to be specifically speaking about like the journey of the shaman and you know what we all know happens at some point along that journey. A lot of times people have a spiritual emergency or some, sci- some sort of psychotic episode that society might call it. Um, and kind of going through that journey and like what ha- how that can lead to changing your life magically and creatively and in all sorts of different ways. Um, and then he's on a panel with Gary Lachman, um, who's actually going to talk about why Freud ran from the occult. So yeah. not saying that Freud um, specifically chose psychoanalysis to become a science, as it's traditionally thought, or at least in, with people I know, is he wanted to make sure that the field was legitimized, you know, and wasn't made into some spiritual hocus pocus kind of thing he wanted it to have legitimacy um and gary wants to talk about why he was overwhelmed by the occult and made that decision to kind of run the other way which i think will be fantastic um we have val denham later that afternoon and she she's going to speak about dreams as an alternate reality and how the dream space informs her work and how Working with dreams and working with art can prevent neuro- neurosis, um, which is fantastic. Peter Gray is also on Friday. Um, mm. And Peter Gray. I'm Charlotte teasing. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Sorry, I thought maybe you didn't hear me. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, Graham Duff is going to be speaking about the visual art of John Balance um, instead of the music, which I think will be interesting as well. And then Langston Khan, who um, is also a shamanic practitioner from here in New York. Um, And he's going to be speaking about the archetypes from a Jungian point of view. But his perspective, which I think is really important, is that we shouldn't just write off archetypes as psychological constructs. um, Because in that way, we're being quite naive to think that there aren't other entities or spirits around us. And we might only be able to understand them through our mind and psychology but that doesn't mean that they're not there so he's going to talk about the difference between like the archetypes as psychological constructs and different spirits um and different like land spirits as well that's going to be good i think that that's necessary for the when we talk about the different healings of different fields for that and magic because uh people have fundamentally misread jung in particular if they think he was saying it's all in your head it's not at all what he was saying the crazy man built a tower beside a lake and you know had poltergeist effects and all this kind of thing happening from his red book work at no time pots and pounds too exactly yeah like at no time did he say it's you know it's all in your head it's yeah we it's funny that uh I'm going to look for, I mean, I love Gary, so that's going to be great, but I'm going to look forward to that because it's almost like Freud got the exact opposite of what he wanted because he wanted it to not be a wishy-washy pseudoscience. You fast forward almost a hundred years and it, the preposterous kind of um, materialist models that they're working to is nothing but a wishy-washy pseudoscience. <laughs> and you I think, know. no, that's a pity. Like he's, his head and heart were in the right place and trying to say, we need to get this away from crazy believers and, and, and keep it in a space where it can be used for transformation and uh, it still ends up with believers. It's uh, so yeah. This is this is quite timely. I like this. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And it's then, really fantastic. And, we should also perhaps mention uh, you've only yet mentioned the sort of the first day. Oh, uh, the first day one. We should also <laughs> name, uh, mention the the that there's going to be um, interesting things going on uh, after each day also. So we'll sort of return to the more social aspect uh, with musical entertainment and and. Um, so it won't be only cramming of uh, mind-blowing ideas. There will be time for for uh, the kicking back and sort of uh, winding down also in the evening. So the third day isn't an exam. 
<rire> oui, je ne comprends pas. <rire> Cool. Do you want to, shall we continue with day two? Because I'm really liking this. Yep. So, um, yeah, in the end of day one, actually, Caitlin Foisy and I are going to present our talk about um, cut-ups and Burroughs and Geisen and our third mind work. We've been working on a book together. And then Carl's screening uh, his new film. Which one? Um, Sabamba Alarma Luna. Oh, very yeah, good. A, it, it's a, uh, a tribute to uh, Derek Jarman's In the Shadow of the Sun from 1975. Excellent that later got a soundtrack by Throbbing Gristle. And I love that film so much, so I've made my own tribute film uh, for it. So Very that's cool. going to be screened. Yeah. Ah, look forward to that. That's good. Yeah. Um, and I won't be able to go through everybody, but just to give you an idea of the other days, like we have some um, Irish Lacanian analysts that aren't occultists at all, um, but they're coming in and one is presenting on like Celtic literature One is presenting on occult in film and David Bowie's film, um, which will be interesting. It's fun day. Um, we have Ingo Lambrecht coming from New Zealand. Um, and he and I actually have a paper that we wrote together in the next Fenris Wolf. Um, yes, yes. He's from South Africa and is trained as a, initiated as a Zengoma in South Africa, the shaman there. Um, but also trained as a psychoanalyst, and now he lives in New Zealand, and he works with the Maori tribe. So he's actually going to speak about his clinical work with the Maori tribe and his experience as being a psychoanalyst and a shamanic healer, um, which will be quite great. And we have Stephen Reisner, as I said. He's the Freudian expert who's going to be talking about Freud's early papers on the occult. Um, we have a poet and writer, Katie Bohink, that's going to be speaking about Um, the 12th house in astrology and its relation to the unconscious and art. Um, we have another Haitian voodoo practitioner, Demetrius Lacroix, who's going to be speaking about the seven souls, the Haitian idea of the seven souls. Um, Jesse Hathaway Diaz is a Kimbanda Tata um, and is initiated in Ifa and Santeria. And he... <coughs> He's going to be speaking about how he can understand the psychological constructs of the client sitting in front of him based on the spirits that present themselves to work with that client. Um, Very cool. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, that's going to be good. Uh, do you want to keep going through the list or shall we chat about some <laughs> of these topics? Because I'm like, oh, I must, I must ask them about that. <laughs> it's up to you. <laughs> ah, Very cool. So, If we look at the spectrum of, uh, well, the sort of pre-intersectional spectrum of occultists, psychoanalysts, psychology type, and artists, uh, what would you hope, and I'll start with Carl with this one, what would you hope uh, occultists get out of the event? And then that gives Vanessa enough time to think about what she would potentially hope people with a more psychoanalytical background <laughs> will get out of the event. And then we'll, we'll land on artists, which would probably be Carl as well. But go, occultists. Mm -hmm. Uh, I uh, hope I, I, I'll stick to, to the hope uh, angle and I hope that uh, the people who are mainly coming from an occult background uh, will have their uh, sort of uh, minds opened uh, to see the possibility of research either through entering some kind of um, uh, psychotherapy yourself or simply immersing yourself in study of these very fascinating things that are basically the same, but expressed in a different language. I, I sound like a parrot in a way, but th these are really crucial and, and uh, uh, interesting things, I think, because of all these um, areas, even you know, academia as such, uh, occultists have become uh, a bit too conservative, I have to say. And I, I can see that it's opening up now with new ways of thinking and new ways of uh, looking at things um, because it's not just enough to stick with one arcane system and, and uh, believe that that will help us in this day and age because I don't think it will. I think it will be this classical, you know, museum of magic uh, uh, concept or whatever um it won't bring bring any good it'll it's a kind of escapism mm -hmm. by opening yourself to influx from these uh, various things you know art is a very huge area but also but simply for for psychology and these kinds of 
ways of looking at the essential thing, which is the mind. You know, the mind is the center of everything. And around that, we can say that we have emotional clusters or or um, behavioral patterns or, uh, you know, all these classic childhood things. But still, uh, it's all in the mind, even for the occultist. They know that. But they are sometimes a bit too uh, shrouded, literally, in old ways of thinking. And uh, in a way, it's paradoxical because it used to be the other way mm-hmm. around. It used to be that the were the, both proto-scientists and pioneers of the mind. But I yep. think now o- occultists need to be pushed into environments like this um, for cross-fertilization and realizing that there are many avenues uh, that one can uh, sort of walk on, many paths to tread, uh, but essentially they're all the same. It's just a matter of um, being open-minded to the fact that a lot of you know, so serious or adult or even academic people um, can actually have a lot to add to this very otherwise uh, secluded path of um, of occultism. So I think we're going to help by uh, exhibiting the art, by having this kind of musical entertainment, and also, of course, the panels. Um, and my hope is that people go home, um, I don't know, hopefully a bit confused, but out of the confusion will come uh, uh, potentially some really good stuff. I like that. So Vanessa, do you want to do the same question for, you can't use the sure. same answer either. You have to think of a different one for people coming <laughs> no, at it from I mean, like a psychology, psychoanalytics, analytics angle. Well, what I, we're, at, we're actually just began to be sparked. Um, my group uh, that I helped facilitate, Das Umbehagen, um, we had a conference in Iceland um, in the fall of 2014, and we specifically had it there because um, psychoanalytic practice is really centralized in like Europe and North America, South America. So we wanted to have it somewhere that was like a middle ground and no man's land. Um, there's literally like four psychoanalysts in Iceland. Um, Do they the all know country. each other? <laughs> of course. Yeah. They're um, patients probably. <laughs> they're really excited to have us there. But we wanted to kind of meet in a middle ground um, between these two continents, you know. And um, that's where I met Ingo, actually, who I was saying that I wrote this paper with. And what actually really struck me, I mean, he gave two talks. We had a, a panel on psychoanalysis and religion and a panel on psychoanalysis and psychosis. And he spoke on both of those. And he talked about um, how he keeps his work as a shaman and a shamanic healer and a psychoanalyst very separate. And only in very few cases with clients does he um, ever bring them together. And in the psychosis panel, he spoke about a patient, which he did bring the two together. And, you know, I won't go into it, but the patient was very stuck. Um, Her parents had passed away. And he just felt like she couldn't get through whatever she needed to work through, through the top treatment. Um, And maybe she could eventually, but he really felt she was stuck. So he decided to do this ritual with her. And he like brought her, you know, to a lake and they did this ritual for her parents who had died and um, whatever. And then the patient had a breakthrough in her treatment and was able to move forward. And it was a really beautiful story. And the immediate reaction from all the analysts was, why would you do that? You know, that's an ethical to take the patient out of the office. Um, why would you do something through action when you can do it through words? You need to keep it contained to the analytic space and on and on and on. There's just like this very negative quick reaction. And all I could think was, of course, mm. analytic space is really useful and language is really useful. But but just because you can work through things symbolically through speech doesn't mean that it doesn't work to work things through in the real world with real materials you know, like that life still works outside of language just because we've invented language, you know. So I just really felt shocked that there was like such a reaction to this presentation. Um, and then I realized like my whole training is kind of based on that. So I think it's really what I want the analysts to get from this is that like talk is great, but there are other avenues and working with the land work, rituals work, working with other people works like Alkitsis Dimek is talking about um, working through the body. Um, I think that's really important. And, and like I said, understanding that this isn't all just metaphor and it isn't all just language. There are, the world is alive. Um, there are spirits. I love Peter and Alkitsis 
um, point of view that like animism is really important if we want to save the earth because um, if people believed that the earth was alive, maybe we wouldn't be treating it this way and, and damaging it yeah. the way we have. And I feel like psychoanalysis is a field, not only is really divided between all the different types of psychoanalysis, but it's really just stuck in academia. It's not even actually in clinical practice anymore. In my graduate program, I read one paper by Freud in the five years I was there, and I was specifically in the analytic track. So like, it's really hard to get this, these ideas um, in clinical work at all. And I really feel like I want to get them out more to the broader public, to more clinicians and have more cross-cultural feeding um, because I feel like the analysts, the very few that there are, are just all kind of talking to themselves in this really insulated way. I like that. I think it's um, something Carl touched on about the rise of intersectionality over the last decade because mm -hmm. uh, I think, and, and it's probably a, a kind of, sort of post-digital hangover that we we can kind of blend into and out of ivory towers so what you're hoping it's kind of like the the flip side of what carl said which is essentially restoring uh therapeutic legitimacy to ritual action and and, and land action because it it is very word and and, and head-based over the last century and say psychoanalytics Nice. Okay, who wants to do who wants to do the artist one? Because this is the most difficult. What could you possibly hope artists would get out of it? Because uh, yeah, Carl, you have to take the hard question. Yeah, or at least uh, begin it. Uh, I mean, I think the the, the, uh, the thing is that uh, since artists are usually uh, involved in an already uh, introspective, uh, but also intuitive, and I should hope also open-minded attitude. I mean, it's a this thing you you call the flow, and you're in your um, uh, studio space or your desk or wherever you're working. Uh, you're already um, familiar with working with very irrational processes and very emotional processes. There could be also intellectual strains in there. Today, I would argue that there are too many, uh, too much intellectual strains. <coughs> but um, they, the artists in question, uh, probably feel intuitively more attracted to the occult, simply for this reason that uh, it's a world of symbols. Uh, and symbols are gateways to um, higher states of mind, potential change, um, this idea that you can change the outer by doing things in the inner and also working with art in a talismanic way, which is what art has always done, basically. They, it's easier for artists to sort of feel an affinity uh, with uh, with the occult, I would say, although it's a generalization. So I would hope, for same as with the occultists, that the artist would really move and take a look um, uh, towards the... Uh, uh, the analytic side, but let's call it the psychological side and see <clears throat> how uh, much um, concepts and ideas from psychology could be integrated in their own art. So I would say that the utilitarian uh, aspect is the one that's most attractive to artists. They will, you know, can I work with this? Can I integrate this somehow? And then the, uh, very likely they won't go uh, for the angle. Can I integrate this in my life, in my own process of becoming a better human being? They want to integrate it in their art. Uh, although for most artists, essentially that is the same thing because they are working with an expression of what's inside. So I cannot say, you know, whether I hope that they, uh, they all start therapy. Uh, maybe they should. Uh, but but in, in terms of that, I think that, again, it's a, a matter of language and just a way of approaching things. Uh, although reading about psychology is one thing and being part of a th therapeutic process is a completely different one. I can feel very, you know, um, inspired by reading a lot of psychological literature, uh, but I've also been fortunate to be uh, specifically in psychoanalysis uh, about 10 years ago. I was in analysis for four and a half years, and it did me a lot of good on my magical levels. You know, it, it was totally integrated within that process. Uh, so I think there's a great potential uh, studying you know, taking part of these panels, but also potentially uh, looking at uh, integrating some kind of real therapeutic process uh, to see the stuff you're working with, but from a slightly different angle. Nice. I want to come back to the psychotherapy occult thing. Vanessa? Mm. 
Um, well, what I would say is that, um, I mean, I see everything through the psychoanalytic lens at this point. I just can't help it. It's been trained into me. But um, like I said, I, I write a lot about, um, I write different art reviews from a psychoanalytic perspective, and I usually write about artists utilize the cut in some way because I really feel like the cut is essential to creation mm-hmm. um, but I, one of the things like most of the artists that I've written about are their work is done, they're dead it's a completed body of work um, and that's one of the things that's been interesting about work with Genesis and writing about her art is that it's still an ongoing unfolding body of work and the feedback I've gotten back from her is that you know, reading my papers and what I have to say about her work and through our discussions that I hope her see what she's doing in a way that she might not have seen if it wasn't through our dialogue and, and, and showing her that there's these analytic ideas in play that she's playing with and working with um, without being necessarily aware of them. Um, so I'm hoping that maybe some of the artists that are working today and coming to the conference can kind of have a similar sort of experience where they can kind of apply the ideas that we're going to be presenting to what they're already doing what they're doing. Um, one of the things I found in the, the cutting creation talks that Caitlin Spoisy and I have been doing is that um, everybody in the audience, like we try to make our discussions very interactive. Um, and we encourage people to interrupt us and cut us off and kind of jump around so that the whole presentation is like in the cut up form. But, um, cut up form. Um, but, um, like people are able to apply the ideas to most everything they do hmm. in one of our talks we had a gardener who's like basically what I do is cut ups like I take these plants that are native to all different parts of the world and I pull them out of their native settings and I put them together in this new way um, we had a baker that said the same thing all these ingredients and like a lot of these ingredients have symbolic value whether I'm using cinnamon or anisette or whatever um, and thinking more intentionally about like, what kind of mixture she's making. That's a more magical way of thinking about it um, instead of psychoanalytic. But I guess psychoanalytic, if you want to think of it symbolically. So just hopefully getting these ideas to each other and then being able to see how we already use them or can use them more intentionally in our own work. I like that. So funnily enough, that's quite an occult thing. So like coming back to Carl and the the psychoanalysis occult sort of spectrum, uh, Israel Regatti, for instance, was quite keen on the idea that people actually go through at least a year's worth of psychotherapy yep. before embarking on it. And on a, on a macro level, kind of pulling in what Vanessa just said, uh, it's it's quite good at shining a light on the existing internal and external processes that a magician goes through. But on, on a, as you say, it's it's also quite opportunistic. Like there's there's available tech that there's no reason why you shouldn't be using. Uh, which is, uh, you know, a, a new language and way of seeing the world. And it's interesting that you mentioned the gardeners and, and the bakers who think, well, actually, I use that kind of cut-up approach myself because it, every time I hear something like that, it reminds me of the kind of very animistic sort of hermetic idea of co-creation of reality because you are kind of applying mm-hmm. internal structures in a dialogue to how you relate to the world. And once you kind of realize that once you get like a an external third person perception on this is in fact what you're doing you do it much better if it's a cult if it's art mm-hmm. if it's what have you mm-hmm. that's what psycho the point of psychoanalysis is too i feel is that to, to help people see these um these patterns that are already so ingrained in them usually from the parent society and that sort of thing and then once you're able to see the pattern you can separate yourself from them a bit instead of acting them out just in the repetition compulsion impulsively, you can see yourself acting them out for a while, and after a while, you can implement your will more and choose more how you're going to enact things. Well, I like that. I think that's quite a good uh, thing to leave people with. So, in terms of obviously, all the the URLs will be available with the video and and on the blog and and everywhere. But for people who should be everyone. Who's going to be coming to this event? Uh, where do they go to buy tickets? What's the story? How do we how do we find out more about this amazing event next month? Well, uh, of course, there, there's a, my email address. Yeah, cool. So there, there's a Facebook ahead, page Carl. for the event, mm-hmm. uh, and there's also uh, two main websites. One is Unbehagen 
dash events dot org and the other one is uh, das unbehagen dot org right we can pr- we're gonna yeah i I've, i already have the links because i bought the tickets but uh yeah. we'll do that one and the facebook page and uh i'm really looking forward to this I think this is going to be fantastic. I think, you know, you guys have programmed an amazing event. It's going to go really, really well. Um, some really clever ideas that I'm uh, I'm very much looking forward to seeing how how they all uh, thrash around. Mm-hmm. No, it's going to be great. And also on the networking level, I think it will be fantastic to meet people l- truly from other worlds, yeah. you know, in that sense, because we're so accustomed each to his own and we've gone to so many similar you know symposia and conference etc but it's usually the same people you meet in this case it will be quite a different story well we got south africans coming from new zealand we got americans we've got swedes obviously <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah 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 Oh, well, thank you very much. This was fascinating. And now, you know, I'm going to have to get like an advent calendar and and cross off the nights because this is going to be really, really fun. Yeah, yeah. No, fantastic, Gordon. And and, uh, we'll keep in touch, of course, but uh, time flies, so we'll meet up soon. You will. Yeah, well, we will. We all will. Brilliant. (laughs) Thank you very much. It's the fifth, our month from today. Nice. Mm -hmm.